Yeah, it's it's like any sport. You know, you can read all of the rules. You could read all the rules to tennis, and then you go and step out on the court, and you're never going to play perfectly because it's not enough just to know the cues and know the rules. It's the same with body language. You can't just learn what cues mean. Welcome to another episode of SaltCube Analytics, a channel dedicated to decoding human behavior. My guest today is Dr. Avi Marono, a next generation scientist and one of the brightest young minds I have encountered in my conversations with exceptional people. Abby's journey is remarkable, not only because she published her first scientific papers with only 19 years of age, but because she had the courage to change course when she found herself in a dead end. As so many people do, myself included, Abby focused her research initially on deception detection, the holy grail of social sciences, only to find what 75 years of deception research already had established, that contrary to popular belief, there are no universal non-verbal deception indicators that Pinocchio's nose does not exist. But it does not mean that the study of non-verbal communication does not hold enormous potential when it comes to decoding a person's personality, intentions, motivations, unconscious thoughts and feelings, fears, status, dominance, or even his or her opinions on specific topics. So Abby redirected her research from deception detection to nonverbal cues of comfort versus discomfort, and she did so in an area that, so far, had received little attention, the lower body. Working with practitioners in the field, like the nonverbal communication expert and former FBI special agent Joe Navarro, Abby created her behavior sequence analysis, a new method that achieves its reliability through the observation and categorization not of individual nonverbal behaviors, like crossing the arms means someone is closed and defensive, but through multiple behaviors that must occur in a specific sequence. The good news is that anyone can learn behavior sequence analysis, one just has to know what to look for. To get a more comprehensive view on nonverbal communication, we also discussed microexpressions, which became known to the general public via the TV series Lie to Me. We discussed how to build, maintain, or lose trust via nonverbal communication and how your own facial mimicry can affect your emotions and as a consequence your decisions. What really stands out in this interview is Abby's lucid view on the many myths that exist around body language and nonverbal communication and we are exploring how they maintain themselves despite ever-growing scientific evidence against them. If you hold any of those erroneous beliefs, you might want to question your assumptions if you don't want to jeopardize your private or business relations. And this interview is packed with practical tips for those interested in reading people beyond popular belief. If you are a professional who depends on the accurate analysis of what you see in other people, then you might find that Abby's scientific discoveries are an essential addition to your social intelligence toolkit. Abby, thank you so much for joining a second time. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. You're most welcome. Just for the benefit of our of our audience here, we had already a recording. We had some technical uh, issues and Abby was kind enough to agree to kind of redo this uh, this whole interview. There were some really in interesting parts and going on my list, which I have in front of me, what we would like to cover today is the evolution of body language, where body language came from, why it's so ingrained in what we see and what we do, nonverbal communication, nonverbal communication misconceptions, and then something really interesting because this is uh, based on Abby's latest research, behavior sequence analysis, overlapping with the lower body, also with the analysis of the lo lower body. Then we go into, we cannot really skip deception detection, right? And an overlap here with the with micro expression that we will cover. A very interesting topic also, how to build, lose and keep trust. Same as you, Abby. I had a really interesting interview with uh, Robin Drake in regards to, uh, to building trust. Yep. Also very interesting. The nonverbal mimicry, I heard it talking about, Abby. If we still have time, then we cover evolutionary psychology, neuromarketing, heuristics. 
to cover, you know, to give to give a rounded impression of your knowledge in regards to these areas. Before we start, Evie, let me congratulate you. You are now doctor, right? I am. Dr. Evie yeah. Marono. Tell us, tell us a little Thank bit you. about your journey. Um, my PhD was tough. Um, I'm glad it's over is what I can say. It was a long journey. It was a tough journey. Um, it was a lot of hard work, um, especially through a pandemic when I was doing nonverbal mimicry as my PhD topic and it was all using motion capture. So it was all in person um, and I focused on the lower body. So the pandemic caused a lot of issues um, regarding everything that I did. Um, but um, I persevered and got through it. And I think I will return to my PhD studies and publish them, uh, but I'm just gonna leave it for a while and recover. So how did the pandemic affect your study because you of course you studied people so how did you do this during yes. the during the pandemic so my phd was focused on how we can use nonverbal communication um specifically nonverbal mimicry to create cooperation in interpersonal relationships so i had to bring in pairs of individuals i had strangers acquaintances and romantic partners and i'd bring them into the lab and fit them with motion capture suits so it meant that I had to bring in strangers in close proximity and touch all of them to fit them in the suits and then have them interact. So it made it very difficult when my labs were closed um, because of the pandemic. And then when we were back in person, there was a um, two meter rule that we had to be two meters apart. And that wouldn't work for me because I was using this creation of feelings of closeness and rapport and trust to create the cooperation. And we know that proximity affects that. So if I say you're limited to the proximity you can get within each other, that could have an effect on the outcome. So it had quite a few major issues and myself and um, my confederates, um, we all took it in turns to get COVID. Um, so it caused some issues with that too. Um, so I had to readapt, um, but it actually worked out better because I wouldn't have done anything virtually if it wasn't for the pandemic um, and what it forced me to do is in my final study have a look at how we can use nonverbal mimicry online and that was extremely important especially now that we're half virtually learning and half virtually meeting and then the other half in person so it's it's really good because I got to do both in person and virtual I think that was a lesson that we all learned. We got used yep. to these, this kind of communication. And we will come back to mimicry, but also the, the challenges communicating in the way we're just doing, because we are only seeing part of our, you know. Yep. Uh, we will come back to that. I have it on my list. But first, um, you're also the director of Brink. Yes. Right? So tell us a little bit about that, uh, that organization. So Brink is Behavioral Research in Communications. Um, and Brink is a group of researchers, practitioners, scientists. And what we do is we just work together and we create research. We look for patterns in data. We do uh, human participants. We go out and collect our own data or we analyze data that exists. Um, and what we tend to do with Brink is we work for companies privately. So a company that wants to find out something in the literature or wants to um, do an experiment they will hire our company to do private research for them so we can say to them these are these are real world behaviors and these are our findings that we're not releasing to the wider public um, because what I, I tend to do is I coach nonverbals and I coach things that I research and then publish um, but what I do like to do with companies is when we are not publishing that work and we are just providing them the data reports, they know that that information isn't going beyond their company um, and it's restricted to them. So we do those kinds of work. So we're very flexible with what we do. And it's it's been a great adventure bringing people from different fields because I love interdisciplinary research. I love working with neuroscientists and feminists and cognitive scientists and bioscientists and then bringing them to this nonverbal field and you can do such creative and exciting research when you bridge this gap between the different fields how many researchers do you have um so 
it varies really because like I said it's interdisciplinary so we've got our group um, but we kind of all have our own things and then we come together I'd say there's probably about 15 of us but not 15 of us that work on everything it's just those that we bring in that are kind of relevant to what we're doing and those that have the time to work on stuff so it's not a huge commitment for all the researchers practitioners involved it's it's a group of individuals that just love science and love research and want to just discover things. And as far as you can tell, I don't know if you have if you are at liberty to tell, yeah. What would you what would you say would would have been the most let's say groundbreaking discoveries that you have made under the umbrella of Brink? Um, so I can't tell you the research that we've not published and that we've um, provided to companies sort of restricted. Um, but the most exciting studies that I um, have done and will be publishing are those looking at the lower body because I think the lower body tells us so much about how people feel and it's just not something that much of the literature focuses on yet the lower body is so honest because it's not restricted by social convention the same way that the face and the hands are and what I mean by this is social convention of you know how we feel we should behave if you've said something i don't like or i don't want to be in this interaction i can't sit and scowl at you because it's it's just not acceptable and it's rude so you know i'll be very careful what i'm doing with my hands my lower body i'll probably fake smile but the lower body doesn't have that restriction because we don't think you know i've got to tell my feet um to behave we just act very naturally with the lower body so that was kind of my focus there. Um, and we found some very interesting stuff with the lower body. And you were kind enough to share your research papers with, with me. I have read them all with great interest. And I will, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that the rest of the community will, will do the same. Yeah, it's really, really interesting uh, what Thank you discovered. You. Okay. I just would like to mention, I came across you by recommendation of Joe Navarro, with whom you have also done some, some research papers yes. together. Can you tell us about the, um, some of the research that you did together with Joe Navarro? Yes, so Joe Navarro is my mentor. Um, we've been working together for years. Um, I've actually ruined his retirement um, and we are writing a book together. I think he thought that he was done um, and he's not. Um, so I've, we're working on lots and lots of research papers. Um, and probably my favorite ones again are the lower body ones we looked at indicators of distress and discomfort in the lower body um, and then we also looked at one how the orientation of the lower body um, so if i am talking to you and my upper body is facing towards you but my lower body is facing away how that affects perceptions of approachability versus if my lower body is facing towards you um, we're also doing ones looking at how minor movements of the face and tiny, tiny changes can affect perceptions of employability. And the reason we're doing these is because now when we think about recruitment, where do people look? We, we look on LinkedIn, we look on people's social media, we look at their online profiles, and there's always a profile picture. So we want to see how this profile picture can affect perceptions of employability and how minor changes to our face can do so. That leads me to something I have actually not on my list, but there was a very interesting uh, research done on so-called thin slices of behavior, yep. right? I'm pretty sure you're aware. There was a female, female university where they followed the students, I think for 20 or 30 years, and they predicted based on the, year, on the last yearbook uh, picture, they predicted certain qualities that will that would or would not uh, develop into their lives, like successfulness, uh, how how fast they would marry, how quickly they would recover from a loss, how financially secure they would be, all kinds of things from one single pic picture. And they were astonishing accurate. Yeah? Again, the interesting part on this study was that they really followed those those uh, those participants. I'm not entirely sure. Twenty or thirty, even thirty years. So it's it's really a long duration study. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you're absolutely right. You can see you can see from very minor expressions, movements, gestures. You can deduct quite valuable information. Yeah. I mean, there was um, another study on thin slices that I find just extraordinary, 
and it was looking at how we can judge violent behavior from someone's face. Um, and it had images of offenders and they had um, offenders who were non-violent and then they had violent sex offenders. And it was just the image of the face. And people were able to differentiate between the violent sex offenders and the non-violent offenders just by images of their face. Um, so it's it's quite incredible the judgments we can make. Um, that's not to say that we are always accurate because we we only pick up on cues if we are objective or as objective as possible. Because even if the cue is there, if we don't pick up on it, then we won't make that judgment. And it's like when we make judgments of trustworthiness, we make judgment based on perceived trustworthiness, not necessarily actual trustworthiness because there's no way for us to actually measure that we can only measure the perception and I think that is something that is important to take away from these kinds of studies that when we talk about judgments and accuracy of judgments we're talking about accuracy of recognition of cues and these um, judgments that are perceived similar across the board but it doesn't necessarily mean that is how that person is Absolutely. And of course, if you're face to face, then not only your own behavior yeah. influences the behavior of the other person, but also the mental state you are in perceives how you perceive, you know, the behavior of the other person. So it's a really complex, uh, complex area. Yeah. Right? Okay. Now let's begin with the evolution of body language. Why is body language crucial in our communication from an evolutionary perspective? So if we think about the first language that ever developed, it was body language. It was nonverbal communication. Um, when we talk about nonverbal communication, we talk about anything that communicates. It's not a word. So not just body language. Everything that isn't a word is communicating something. But in terms of our body language, when we didn't have verbal language back um, in our history, you know, our ancestors didn't have the English language or any other language. They communicated entirely non-verbally. So if there was a predator, we communicated to those around us that there was a predator with our bodies or with our faces, you know, and we communicated that way. So it has developed in this way of understanding what people are trying to say to us. And in the modern day, if we don't recognize what people's non-verbal cues are trying to tell us, not only are we not validating them, but it means that we're not going to interact with them appropriately. Because if somebody is showing signals of distress or discomfort, and we don't pick up on those cues, and we just keep interacting with this person, or keep trying to get closer, it can cause relationship breakdown. Whereas if someone is showing comfort, and they're showing that they're very happy, they're showing trustworthiness, they're showing that they're enjoying this interaction, and we're not picking up on that, and we let our own sort of insecurities or our own judgments um, outweigh that, then again, we might retreat, thinking that that person wants us to retreat when that person wants us to get closer. So it means when we can understand body language, we can communicate more effectively, and we can communicate with other people on their level, and we can feel, or we can make them feel validated by showing, I understand what you're trying to tell me, and I'm responding. If you talk about body language as a language, right? I think it's a valid comparison, if you will, because in order to be able to read body language, yes. I think you have to put at least as much effort in as if you would really learn a language. It's yep. quite complicated. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like any sport. You know, you can read all of the rules. You could read all the rules to tennis, and then you go and step out on the court, and you're never going to play perfectly because it's not enough just to know the cues and know the rules. It's the same with body language. You can't just learn what cues mean. Um, and it's not that simple either. And then go out and expect to be a body language expert. You have to practice. You have to be very self-aware. Um, we already talked about how people aren't necessarily the best judges of character because we do have things that unconsciously affect our judgments. And we have to learn to be as objective as possible and be self-aware and also know what our body is doing. Um, so it takes practice. It's very, very difficult. And if it was easy, everybody would be a nonverbal communications expert. 
And there's there's so many myths and myth, misconceptions out there too that it stops a lot of people communicating effectively because they're picking up on the wrong cues, they're misreading things, or they are trying to show cues that are myths. They're trying to show, okay, well, I want to show that I'm not being defensive so I won't cross my arms. I want to show that I'm trustworthy so I'll do this behavior. But if they're not actually aware of what behaviors are true, then they're not going to be communicating effectively again. You already mentioned uh, misconceptions, yes. verbal communication misconceptions. Yeah. One example that I like to mention is a study from the Global Deception Research Team. You actually can look it up on the internet. They wrote a, a research paper. I'm not entirely sure there were 100, 100 plus uh, scientists around the world that did the research in 75 different countries in 43 languages. And I mean, they come, they come up with a whole list of um, uh, cues that the general population believes to yeah. be related to deception detection and most of them were incorrect and on top of the list is eye gaze aversion so the most so over 70 percent of the population in the 75 countries believe that if i cannot look you in the eyes i am deceptive and we know from research it's just not true yeah yeah i think a lot of it has to do with you know one tv shows but also documentaries because there's a lot of documentaries out there that talk about nonverbals. And talk about these cues. And I think if people see it in a documentary, they think that it's true. Or they think that it has to be based on fact. And it doesn't. You can put anything in a documentary that you want. It doesn't have to be based on fact. And you can say, supported by scientific research. Yes, but what research? Who did it? When was it done? What did they do? It's not enough just to say this is based on evidence. Because that could mean anything. Um, and I think if we are exposed to things enough, if we hear it... We just assume that it's correct because it's that repeated exposure effect. And because we are constantly exposed to there are nonverbal indicators of um, lie detection, of um, deception even, and there are nonverbal indicators of this, or this means this, so when you cross your arms, it means you're being defensive. And all of these myths that we hear over and over and over, and it's the same with things like micro expressions. We hear them over and over and over, so we just assume that it's all true because it's repeated exposure, but it's not. And it's not what the science tells us. But it's also very difficult for the general population to access the science sometimes because a lot of the time the research papers are behind paywalls or they're in books that are, again, behind paywalls and textbooks. So they are accessing the sources that they can do, newspapers, blogs, and things that aren't scientifically valid, and that's where they're getting their information. And I see non-verbal experts all the time post about deception detection and all of these, yeah. you know, and they talk about baselines, and there isn't actually such thing as a non-verbal baseline. Our, ba our behaviours are very context-dependent. But you see experts put these in blogs, and people don't have to fact check them. They just assume because an expert said it that it's true. And it makes it very, very difficult to communicate the science to people because they're just overflow, or overflowed with these incorrect um, interpretations that it's very difficult for them to mitigate what's incorrect and what's correct. Because you said the documentaries yeah, based on science, like it's yeah. like a movie based on a true story. Yeah, This is like... There's a grain of salt yeah. is in there, right? But but the rest is simply, you know, creative creative interpretation, so to speak. Yep, it's yeah. that based on a story except from all of the parts that aren't. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, behind me, I have, I don't know, I have hundreds of books on the topic, yeah? yeah. And it's just staggering in how many of those books from so-called experts, you find things that we know from science and it's for everybody there to read. It's factually incorrect. Yep. This, this is how this gets propagated and propagated. And then we have the cognitive bias, availability bias. Yeah, yep. it's exactly what you said. The more often it's going to be repeated, the more the more likely is that we that we that we believe it on a subconscious level, not consciously. Yep. And it's that familiarity effect as well. We become familiar with information and it becomes comfortable to us, especially if we hear it when we're young. Um, and then the more we hear it, it's more familiar. So it's a comfortable fact to go back to. And then when someone challenges that, 
even if you don't remember where you got your information from, you get quite defensive because you're like, no, this is true. And you see that a lot with lie detection. Um, and it's probably one of the biggest misconceptions in the field just because it it's so huge. There's so many lie detection books. And I think a lot of people, again, get their information from popular science books. Now, I love popular science books. I read them all the time. But you do have to be cautious that it's not a research paper. People can be subjective. They talk about their views. They talk about their opinions. And that's great. It's interesting to read. But you have to go to the source of the information before you really create this. This is true versus this is false. Absolutely right. Uh, a, last, a last point I would like to make before we move on to behavior sequence analysis, which is a much more serious topic is that unfortunately also professionals succumb to those processing of misconceptions. And if I say professionals, I mean law enforcement, lawyers, judges, yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. There is ample scientific evidence showing us that they are exactly at the same level as the lay person, 54%. Yep. And if we, if we think about practitioners, it's not their job necessarily to go out and read the science. They're practitioners. Their job is to do the work and to implement the science. So if they are hiring experts to come and coach them and train them and do talks, and that expert is teaching them something, of course they're going to believe it because they're bringing them in for that knowledge. They don't have the time to go out and go to the source. Maybe they can't access the papers. That's why they hire experts. That's why we have nonverbal coaches. That's why we have coaches for all these other topics to come and provide us the information that they have gone out and fact-checked and they have gone out and researched themselves. So we trust them for those reasons. And I think a lot of it may be to do with showmanship because people are very interested in learning about these things. So people teach it because it gets views, because it gets an audience, or because they want to believe it. And it it is a shame because, like you said, it's a real issue if we are a practitioner and we have been taught that this is what to look for so we then apply these techniques it's going to lead to bad practice and it's not the practitioner's fault because like I said it isn't necessarily their job to go and read the papers but they're being provided with incorrect information yeah you have a generation after generation after generation exactly. a trainer teaches another trainer teaches another trainer and it's all yeah. based on yeah yeah. One, one last example, yeah. Albert, Albert Mechabian, yeah. Uh, he did two research papers, and that, yep. from my point of view, that's one of the greatest myths out there that 93% of all communication is based on nonverbal communication. Right? So, so, actually, Albert Mechabian is still alive. I tried to reach out to his, his, he must be in the, in the 80s now, yeah. Um, but he has still an active website and he tries to rectify the misuse of his two research papers. Um, yep. on his website till till today. I mean, I think he is an extraordinary researcher. I have a lot of respect for the work that he does. And, you know, I will hold my hands up too and say, I've done research papers in lie detection. They were the first things that I did when I was 19. I published my first two papers and I wanted to look for cues for deception. And obviously what I was just finding was cues for high stress and then show indicating that that person is, you know, in a stressful situation. And then I took that as lie detection. I did write in the paper that it, it could be high stress and not necessarily lies. But it's a case of, you know, nobody is perfect. Even Albert Einstein, um, you know, um, he published Ooh. incorrect theories um, and then yep. said, biggest mistake of my life. Nobody is perfect. We do that as researchers. You make mistakes. You do it as practitioners, as scientists, as human beings. But then you rectify, and that's how we learn. We learn from bad science, and then we do better science. Um, but I am a huge fan of Albert's work, just a huge fan. And in terms of this percentage of how much of our communication is nonverbal, again, it varies. You know, there might be some situations where it's 100%, some situations where it's 50%. I think it's very difficult to put this percentage on it. And I avoid doing so. I just say that the majority of our communication is nonverbals because we know that most of our communication is nonverbal. 
but it's just not possible to put this exact percentage onto it. I don't want to spend too much time on this point, yeah, but actually his, his research was not really that bad. Yeah? It, was, it was only limited to a specific uh, scenario, happiness, for example. Yep. It was only taken out of context by generation after generation after generation yep. from, from practitioners and, and body language experts. They misrepresented his research. The research itself is, is very clear and very straight in what it is about. Yep. Yeah? So we, we, cannot really, we cannot really put the responsibility here solely on, on, on Albert. Yeah, again, I, I think he is a fantastic researcher. Um, and a lot of the time, especially when we have um, researchers whose work has been translated, um, a lot of the time the work is translated incorrectly. And that's where myths such as that we only use 10% of our brain comes from or that we're left-brained, right-brained and you only use the left brain or something if you're creative, right brain if you're intelligent. And that came from research being misinterpreted and it's the same with lots of health research. So sometimes it's not actually the researcher, it's you know the generation onwards that they've taken their results and... Sometimes you see it in current research papers that they'll talk about studies and they'll talk about what they found and what it means. And then you go back to that study from the literature review and actually they've misinterpreted what they've said to make it fit their agenda. And that is very, very common in research. And if you're just reading literature reviews and, you know, you don't have time to go back to every reference study because you would never finish a research paper. So you just take what that person has said because you think it's peer reviewed. So it's factual, but things do slip through the cracks. So it is very, very difficult. So this is a perfect segue into your own research in regards to behavior sequence yes. analysis. So let me think this through. So what would be your worst nightmare that the next generation of uh, researchers does with your research in regards to behavior sequence analysis? Where could they go, where could they go wrong? So I think when it comes to behavior sequence analysis, the idea is that rather than looking at individual behaviors, we look at the sequence in which they occur. Um, I think a misinterpretation of this could be that you have to have exact sequences. So if we talk about a sequence like, you know, I'm just stressed, maybe I bring my um, elbows close and then I bring my hands close and then I put my head down and a misinterpretation could be that there is only distress if you see that exact sequence and that isn't necessarily the case um, because I'll explain one of the papers that I did to put it into context um, so I did a research paper looking at nonverbal indicators of distress of the lower body and I'll be talking about this at the behavior analysis conference very soon um, and what we found was that there were sequences so behaviors that occurred one following the other than the other um, that were indicative of distress. Um, and what we did was we looked at live interviews where the interviewee was asked a very uncomfortable, very personal and quite rude question. And then they had reported distress after that question. And then we compared that to a group of individuals who had been asked a question and there was just no distress following that. Um, and what we looked at was the behaviors of the lower body instantly following that question being asked and we found that if people brought their knees together and then brought their feet together and then tucked their feet under the chair that was indicative of distress but bringing the knees apart and the feet apart and then spreading the legs kind of out was indicative of comfort um, and what we found in general it's the case of bringing yourself smaller so there were also patterns like bringing the knees together and then putting the hands on the knees and then tucking the feet under the chair. Um, but the point is that it's not necessarily that exact sequence. It's enough to know that the sequence has to be closed. So if I close myself off in a sequential pattern, maybe I bring one arm closer to my body and then I bring my knee closer, that's still a sequence indicating that I am in distress because it's that closing behavior. It doesn't necessarily have to be that exact foot, that exact leg. Um, and we looked at right leg versus left leg. If I bring my right in, my right leg in, then my left leg in, is that a different pattern than the other way around? And it wasn't. It didn't matter if I brought one leg or two legs, same with one hand versus two hand. 
it was just the importance of making myself small showed distress. That's something really important to take into consideration. Okay. So it's about comfort versus discomfort. It's yes. not about truth yes. or lies. And, and you put anything, so you see everything as a sequence. For example, a closing uh, movement. Everything that closes the body could be part of the sequence. How many items? Do um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a certain amount of items. Um, you know, you can have three behaviors or four behaviors, five behaviors. It doesn't matter as long as it's one following the other. And the reason why sequences are so important, because if I brought my knees together and then I brought my feet out, so I start with this closing gesture and then I lead with an open gesture and then I bring my feet in, that isn't indicating that I'm in distress because it has to be this pattern of closed, 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 not closed, open, open, closed. That shows that that isn't necessarily distress. That could show conflicting moods or it could just show that that's that individual trying to get comfortable because it isn't that pattern of repeated closing behaviors. If I understood you correctly, if you have a sequence, but in the sequence of, let's say, let's say four or five behaviors, you have one out of sync, you, dis, you disregard the, the whole sequence? So it depends on when the question is asked and then when the question is finished. So they might ask a question and there might be a really quick response. And whilst I'm given that response, I might show two behaviors or there might be a long response and I'll show two or three behaviors. But then the next time that response is over, the sequence begins again. So it doesn't carry on from the next one. So if I'm asked question one and then I show three behaviors and then after three, I'm asked a second question, the sequence starts again because it's a new stimulus response, if that makes sense. So it's a case of when that reaction is finished is when the sequence is finished. Okay. You ask a question. So anyone ask a question and the receiver of the question displays a certain a variation of behaviors, yep. right? Now I know when the next question comes, at least then the sequence is over. Yeah. But I could imagine a person never really sits completely still, never does not express anything. So how, when do you know that the sequence is actually over? So it typically is when something new begins. So if you've asked me a question, um, I might for ages continue to show these um, indicators of distress. So say I show four behaviors in a row showing distress and then I start to open myself up, that could start to show, okay, I had this instant response of distress and now I'm kind of, okay, now I'm self-reflecting and thinking I have to kind of um, bring myself back to normal. So it can show either that person is now... Um, saying to themselves, okay, I have to react in a certain way. Again, social convention, because we self-correct our behaviors. So we know that we respond to things and then we go, okay, you know, this is how I should respond. So we self-correct. So it, it depends on that person, that sequence, they might stay very closed for the rest of the interaction. It's very difficult to say from here that this is exactly what it means. And this is the same for every person, because that would be a mistake. If I said to it, it's five behaviors long and it's four behaviors long or it stops here, stops there, that would just be false because people are so individual. You have to judge it based on what you're seeing. If you are in real time, you don't count the behaviors. You judge it based on what is in front of you and you respond based on that real world interaction. And I think this is where a lot of research goes wrong because we want things that are prescriptive. We want to know exactly what this means, what this one behavior means. If we see this cluster, how many behaviors do we need to see at once for it to mean something? And humans are not necessarily prescriptive and nonverbal communication isn't prescriptive. So it's not one size fits all. We want these one size fits all so we can then go and learn them and apply them. But we have to be adaptive because behavior is adaptive. And context dependent. Exactly. Everything is very, very context dependent. And that's the issue with baselines when we talk about, okay, what's a person's natural behaviors? What is their baseline? But our baselines are very, very context dependent. So I might show very different behaviors if I'm in a group of three, a group of five, 
if I'm in a social setting, but I'm in a conference where I'm very comfortable versus I'm in a social setting and I'm in a bar or something where I'm very uncomfortable, my baseline in that context will be very different than my baseline in the other context. So we have to take into consideration context when we analyze anyone's behavior. One brief, one brief comment in regards to baselines, because I have discussed baselines on a number of, of occasions also with the law enforcement. Yep. Right? And for me, and I, I look at this from a negotiator, so cooperation, uh, negotiating uh, context, right? And what I see is that, yes, baseline, you can do a baseline, you know, in a, in a, in a low stress environment. But then what's commonly yep. appears, what, what, commonly, what commonly happens is you then compare the signals that you see in a low stress, stress environment with the signals you see in a high stress environment. So for, for me, it's like comparing apples to peers. You would have to, you know, compare high stress with high, high stress. Otherwise, you know, yep. the, the signals are completely out of sync. Yeah, and this is something that I found in that same study that I was talking about with the nonverbal indicators of distress we found behaviors in the comfort condition that are indicative of distress in other literature. Things like we saw crossing the arms and we saw people place their hands on their genitals. And that is a very protective gesture. We know that we do that when we feel defensive, but it was happening in the comfortable and the uncomfortable context. And the reason is because an interview can be intimidating so we are likely to see more of these defensive displays or these protective displays because it's an uncomfortable context things like negotiations too they can be very high pressure any high pressure environment we're likely to see behaviors that indicate anxiety indicate a bit of distress and that is completely natural so we have to be aware that this one behavior doesn't mean I am making this person feel anxious. It likely means this person is just a little bit anxious because of the context. This is very important to realize when we're virtual because a lot of people now are quite uncomfortable virtual because it's very new and it can be quite personal because you're in your own home. Some people don't feel comfortable having their sort of background on display or being on camera. So they will show anxious displays. And what we tend to see is them really high at the beginning of the interaction, loads of these anxious displays, and they kind of wear off as they get more comfortable. And that's really, really natural. Or we might see a, um, a gesture that is repeated all the way through the interaction because that's their way of self-soothing. And that is likely their way of managing this anxiety due to the context, not due to what you have said to them. Now, let's go once more back to your behavior sequence analysis. Yeah? And I know you said it's not about uh, uh, truth and yeah. deception, right? But I believe you detected some sequences in both scenarios, yeah. right? Um, so the lower body behavior wasn't looking at truth and lies. The lower body behavior was just looking at comfort versus discomfort. And we did see um, sequences in both. So in the comfort um, condition, we saw lots of open gestures. So we saw lots of figure four poses where I put my ankle from one leg onto the knee of the other leg and sit quite open. We saw lots of people kind of spread their legs out because we know that when we are more comfortable, we feel more comfortable taking up space. When we feel uncomfortable, we try to make ourselves almost very small. And we saw this open, comfortable, knees out, legs out, not invasive, but just quite natural. Whereas in the other one we saw more of these closed displays and we did see lots of the same displays lots of individual behaviors that were repeated in both again because one behavior doesn't really tell us much we can't see one behavior say i do a figure four doesn't necessarily mean that i am in that moment very very confident because i might then move my knee down and bring everything very tight to show that i'm maybe trying to show confidence and then i actually feel quite uncomfortable Again, it just shows that behaviors go in both conditions. When we feel uncomfortable, comfortable, we show loads of behaviors. It's that repeated behavior and it's that sequence of loads of closed versus loads of open that we should be paying attention to. Now, if we briefly, I mean, we talked about it already. Yeah? 
psychological arousal. That's actually what it is. Yes. Yeah. So we, we all agree. Pinocchio's nose does not exist, despite all the many books behind me that, who, yeah. claim the, who claim the opposite. Uh, spot the lie, spot the liar, learn how to spot the lie in 30 seconds or whatever. Yeah. yeah. If someone tells you that this person is probably lying. Yeah. So yes. Pinocchio's nose does not exist. If we match this with, sorry, if we overlap this with micro expressions, and the story here, I mean, who really propagated micro expressions, of course, is Paul Ekman. And Paul Ekman is a very interesting uh, researcher, not necessarily because of the micro expressions, but because of the universal, the seven universal emotions that he, that he detected. Very briefly, the context he, in his younger years, I think he traveled around the world also to people and tribes that had little or no exposure to, to the Western world. And those seven universe, that's why they're universal, those seven universal emotions are recognized everywhere around the globe. Of course, there are more emotions as, as those seven, yeah? but we don't have clear signals for them. right? And then he went a step further. He then went into those micro expressions, which then were propagated in this uh, television series based on a true yeah. story, yeah? Lie to Me, right? With, with which he was not really happy himself. So if you briefly can comment on, on micro expressions. So in terms of micro expressions, we have these seven universal expressions, but what a lot of people misinterpret is they think that there are seven expressions and that we show those exact expressions when we feel those emotions. That isn't true. That is not the case. And that is not what Paul Ekman said either. What he did show is that we have seven prototypical expressions. So there are huge variations in these seven emotions that we show of that expression. We just have prototypical ones. So, you know, you can have fear with a slightly different expression than someone else with fear. But that doesn't mean that what he said isn't necessarily true because he never ever said that this one expression is the only expression of fear we have variations again it's been misinterpreted in terms of micro expressions it's a field i stay away from because they can't be detected with the human eye um, even in his research paul ekman said these cannot be detected with the human eye they also don't occur very often if they do occur and we can't do anything with them. We can't detect them. They don't really tell us much. So we we focus on this idea of micro expressions because again, it's appealing because we think if I can notice this flash of an expression, I can see what someone is truly meaning, their true intentions, their true feelings. And that is such an appealing thought to be able to mind read. And it just isn't true. We all want to be mind readers I'd love to be a mind reader, but we can't be. And micro expressions is something I get asked about a lot. And I try not to comment too much on it because I know people, they get very defensive of the field. And you, it, it's a fine line to tread because a lot of experts talk about it. But there just isn't any scientific evidence that they can be used for anything, that they can be used in practice, that we can really do anything productive with them, help anyone in law enforcement, help anyone in the clinical field. So I think we should be focusing on things that we can do, focusing on behaviors that we can spot with the human eye and that do tell us something and then work to implement them into training protocols. I like to talk, to talk about micro expressions because I have literally studied tens of thousands of frames yeah. searching for micro expressions. I'm certified by Paul Ekman International. I'm familiar with Fox spatial action coding system, right? It's exactly what you said with the, with the naked yeah. eye, you, you can forget it. One twenty fifth depends one sixteenth, one twenty fifth of a second. They are very brief. They're not as common and they're very often mixed. Yeah. yeah. It's very often that we have different emotions at the same time. Yeah. Kind of things, yep. yeah. so it's it's a very tricky it's a minefield yep. so and speak, i think yeah. it's so exciting the work that he's done looking at all of the different facial muscles and all of the different facial movements we can do and it's incredible work it's incredible knowledge to have but in practice it's not really that useful to know what all of the different facial muscles do as a medical expert absolutely <laughs> 
But as a law enforcement agent, it doesn't really help you to know the different facial muscles, really. With, with our 43 facial muscles, we can approximately exhibit about 10,000 yeah. different expressions. <laughs> Now try now, now try to study them, you know, as a, as a law enforcement officer, with, exactly. with your best intentions, yeah. And then again, context yep. dependent, and there, there's an interperson difference, all kinds of things. So it's a really challenging field. Yeah. Nevertheless, yep. highly interesting, highly fascinating, and if you have slow motion video, it can tell you something. Yep, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. It's so exciting, but in practice, it's not useful. And I like your comment about having different emotions overlapping because that's research that I'm currently looking at, how we have these asymmetric expressions and how we interpret asymmetric expressions. Um, and we show them all the time. We're constantly showing different emotions on our face, on our bodies. So it's very difficult to mitigate, you know, trust and fear and happiness and sadness because when are we ever one emotion ever? Are we ever just, I feel only this at this moment in time. We often have very mixed feelings and that comes across on our faces and our bodies. One thing that I learned, right? It's really, really difficult for us to fake emotions in our face, right? And one, one thing is that true emotions are synchrone. That means the various muscles work together at the same time, but also symmetric, right? There's only one expression we know of, the one of contempt, which is asymmetric. Everything is, is symmetric. That's not necessarily true. Um, we show multiple emotions on our face all the time. Um, we can show happiness and sadness. I think the idea is, in Paul Ekman's work, he said there's only one asymmetric okay. emotion, which is contempt, which isn't true. That isn't backed up by the science that we have now we do show asymmetric expressions of different emotions. And this is a research project that I've recently got a grant for to study. And it is looking at asymmetric expressions of various emotions that do occur. So asymmetric, I mean asymmetric in the sense, not exactly mirrored from one half of the face to the other. That's what... Yes, so one side of my face okay. will show one emotion and one another. We have that, we have that in person. We show these all the time. They're not as common as symmetric expressions, but we do show asymmetric expressions. And it's called emotional chirality when we show different emotions on the face. And it absolutely occurs. Great. Can you give us an example? So in the study that I'm currently doing, and this is a grant study with myself, um, a perception neuroscientist, and then two clinical psychologists and Joe Navarro. And we're looking at how different emotions on the face are perceived. So all different emotions. We have happiness on one side and happiness on the other or happiness and fear. And we know that we process expressions on one side of the face greater than the other. Um, so we're looking at from a neurological perspective, what emotion we read um, more clearly. And then we're going to apply that to a condition with um, emotional deficits. Um, so there's loads of research that we're currently doing in this field, but it's a misconception that contempt is the only asymmetric we show. We have so many examples of having different emotions looking on the face. Looking forward to this research paper from you, uh, Abby. Yes, I'm very much looking forward to sharing this one. Now let's come to how to build, lose and keep trust, because I know that's a topic that you are quite familiar with and we can right away you know, use it as a, as a gateway into nonverbal mimicry. Um, I like trust because trust is the first judgment that we make about anybody. So we make a judgment over whether someone is trustworthy or untrustworthy within 33 milliseconds of seeing their face. That's how quick that judgment is made. Um, and there's so many ways that we judge trustworthiness, um, but nonverbal communication is the first way that we do it. Um, and there's there's so many behaviors that I could go through here, but I don't think we have time to do all of the trust behaviors. Um, but there are some really, really important ones. So a smile sounds really, really simple, but a smile shows trustworthiness. When we show a smile and we have to make sure that these cheeks are because raised is, as much as possible because, because we're very sensitive. Exactly because we are very sensitive to the fake smile. 
And when we see a true smile, it releases oxytocin in our brain. And what oxytocin does is it says to our fight or flight instinct, this is safe, we don't need to run. So it basically calms down our nervous system. And we think about the smile being a social expression. When we go bowling, and I love this example, when we hit a strike, we don't smile when we hit the strike. We smile when we turn around to our friends to indicate, I'm happy, I've just hit a strike. We wait because it isn't the event that causes a smile. It's that I want to communicate socially my emotions. So the smile is really, really important. But it's not just the smile. We need to make sure we are emotionally expressive. So people who are not very expressive with their faces or with their face are perceived as less trustworthy. So that includes empathy. So if you're telling me that you've had a you know really bad day and I show this neutral expression, it's perceived as untrustworthy because there's no emotional expressiveness. And we know that this positive countenance where I show mostly positive expressions are perceived better. So I'm perceived as more trustworthy when I show continuous positive expressions. But if you're telling me about something negative or something, you know, you've had a bad day or something's happened and I continue to show positive expressions, it's not consistent with the context and it's perceived as untrustworthy because it's perceived as either rude or fake. So the emotions need to be expressive and consistent with the interaction. Um, we also know that we, we don't like when people are very face on because it's very aggressive. We prefer when people are kind of tilted sideways. Um, and when we do that head tilt and we show our neck because this part here, our neck, is a very vulnerable part of our body. So our ancestors, like we said, were in a very dangerous environment. So there was always a threat of predators. So our neck is something that we keep, you know, very protected because that is a vulnerable part of our body. So when we expose our neck to somebody, we're saying, I'm not a threat. I don't perceive you as a threat. And it shows that, you know, I am showing you I'm trustworthy. Um, so there's loads and loads of behaviors we can go through. Um, but again, I'll just pick up on that open versus closed because that is really, really important. Open behaviors. So say I have my arms out or I'm just very comfortable versus closed where I'm very tight. It can be the arms crossed too, but arms crossed does not mean defensive and it does not mean anything negative necessarily. It's very comfortable to sit that way. Um, but when we have lots of closed behaviors, that can be perceived as very uninviting and perceived very negatively. Um, and what I will say about the arms is although the arms crust doesn't indicate discomfort and it doesn't indicate that I don't want to be around you, it can be perceived very negatively because of the misconceptions around it. Because so many people see it as a defensive display. If I have got my arms crossed, it can be perceived as that person doesn't want to be in this interaction. So it's something that I say to be aware of because you might not be doing it for that reason, but you don't want to be perceived like you are. So again, it's a tricky one, but it's something to be aware of. Very briefly in evolutionary terms, right? Same as the, the side of our neck, of course, the fronts of our bellies, they were very vulnerable. Yeah? We, we come from, from quadrupeds, right? So we, are, we feel quite unprotected here. So the arms crossing could be also a shielding or even anything in front of your a glass of water or your handbag or whatever in front of your torso might indicate some, you know, in certain circumstances. Yeah. So again, it's context dependent. Yep. So we do blocking behaviors. We do, if you're sat down and say there's a pillow, what you do see is when someone is quite distressed, they might put their pillow in front of them or they might cross their arms or they might put, you know, anything, their bag in front of them because it is this protection. There's something here blocking you from me. So I am in some way protected. So we do see that. But again, it is context dependent because going back to my study with the interview, we saw these blocking displays 
even in the comfort condition because the context created some discomfort. So people do that to make themselves feel a bit protected. And then you, you see it a lot in therapy. That's why you have like a sofa and a lot of the time you do have cushions because it makes people feel safe. It makes people feel safe when they can protect themselves as much as possible. And if we use this as a gateway into non-verbal mimicry and how you can make feel how you can make somebody feel closer to you via non-verbal mimicry and your own research, of course. Yep. So non-verbal mimicry just refers to if you do a behavior and then I copy that behavior. So say you, you know, you scratch your head and then I see you scratch your head and I scratch my head and we do it very, very naturally. It's an involved behavior. It, according to the research and according to my research, it evolved originally as this perception behavior link so I would learn from other people because I'd watch people do it and then I would do it myself and then as the social world evolved and having social groups became more important the behavior evolved to create harmony so when we mimic someone we have an abundance of research to show that it creates really positive feelings so I feel more trusting towards someone when they mimic me I feel more comfortable, I feel more familiar, I feel more liking towards them. Of course, there are regulations around mimicry in terms of, you know, if you do it one second after they do it, it can be perceived quite negatively because it can be perceived as me copying you. And when it is very overt and we think that someone is doing it to make fun of us or someone is trying to use it as a tool, it actually has this negative effect. But when it's done properly, what it does do is create cooperation. Um, and in my research, I looked at why. So I had trained three confederates in nonverbal mimicry, and they would interact with participants during an investigative interview. Um, and then I wanted to look at how this created cooperation during this investigative interview. And when they were mimicked, they did cooperate more. It created a perception of trustworthiness. And the way it did this was because when someone mimics us, we feel closer to them. And it's this effect of feeling closer. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with emotional contagion. So when we mimic people, we kind of take on their emotions. Um, and this created the cooperation. It actually mediated the effect. So if we don't feel closeness, then that effect of cooperation is reduced. But if we do feel closeness the effect of cooperation is increased. You take on the position of our counterpart and in this way you also take on the emotion, yeah? Because there's this 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 there's this feedback loop between mind body, mind body, mind body. So yes. also Paul Ekman actually did the did the did yep. study with with the Friesen, yep. with his colleagues Friesen, right? In regards to they figured out if they they started to do those those facial expressions themselves, which is quite difficult. Yeah certain the simple, the simple emotion of yeah. sadness is very difficult to, to reproduce, yeah? But he, he tried this for years and he, he became very good of it. And he and his colleagues, they found, for example, when they yeah. smile, they started to feel happy. If they, if they practiced the, the, facial the exact facial expressions of sadness, yep. they became sad. It's called right? facial feedback. Um, so when we show an emotion with our face, it kind of tricks our brain into feeling that way. So in terms of emotional contagion, it's it's called the facial feedback hypothesis. Like you said, when you smile, you become happier. When you show an expression on your face, it kind of tricks your brain into thinking that that's how it feels. Um, and there was a really interesting study done on the facial feedback hypothesis. And it's when we furrow our brows, it shows, you know, we are tend to be quite angry or curious or, you know, quite a negative emotion when we fire our brows. And they applied, um, they gave individuals with depression Botox to stop them feeling negative. And actually it decreased how negative they felt because it reduced that facial feedback of the negative feeling. And I just think that's, it's so interesting. And we talk about fake it till you make it, yeah. but really we can fake it till we make it. Because if we say to ourselves, you know, you, you can't stop things like sweating or going red or blood pressure. But if we say, okay, I'm going to be confident. I want to be happy. 
if we tell ourselves something enough in that situation, it doesn't necessarily mean we will definitely feel it, but we have a better chance of feeling more positive than if we just didn't try with those behaviors. That was Amy Cuddy's study, actually. Fake it till you make it. I think it's the most watched uh, TEDx video ever, 30 something million views. Yeah, that was the um, the testosterone increasing, wasn't it? Uh, exactly. And she said, you know, you have to imagine in your mind this power poses. I invite everybody to to try it out. Amy, do you have five minutes, five minutes to discuss um, evolutionary psychology? Yeah. yeah. So I took up your recommendation and got myself this book. Yeah, a very interesting yep. one. And you might be interested in this one. Yeah, it's a bit more scientific. Okay. Yeah. And also Gard Saad yep. is a evolutionary psychologist, a very interesting um, um, person to, um, to engage with. And through him, I came to that book. And if, okay. if, if I could recommend you one <laughs> book in regards to evolutionary psychology, then it's this one. It is an absolute eye opener. Okay. Right. Because it explains, I mean, it goes back to, you know, mating. Everything goes back to, to mating, uh, mate selection, etc., etc. It It explains, but not justifies why we do what we do. Yeah. Right? Inclusive, inclusive homicides. You will see the, the absolute direct connection and correlation with our evolutionary past. There are reasons yeah. why we do, we do the things. Yeah. That was me talking yeah. and now, have... now your view on evolutionary psychology. Yeah, I mean, I love evolutionary psychology because as a behavior analyst, our behaviors occur through evolutionary psychology. Um, the only issue with that is we have to be careful of um, the ultimate causation and the proximate. So we talk about evolutionary behaviors of this is the ultimate reason why we do things. And that doesn't mean that's why I'm doing things now because the proximate reason why I'm doing things in this current context overrides the evolutionary reason why I do things. So just because we've evolved to show certain behaviors doesn't mean that we are always going to show that behavior because evolution plays a part in everything. But we are human beings living in the current day. So we also have behaviors that aren't to do with evolution or override our evolutionary responses. So it's so important to understand the foundation of what we do. It doesn't explain everything that we do because we have this proximal cause. You know, if we are in an interaction and I'm showing you fear, it can be, you know, this evolved response. But we don't say I'm showing fear because of um, the um, situations I used to be in. You know, my ancestors grew up in. We, we talk about I'm showing it because of this current context. Um, and obviously that's an extreme example, but it's just the point of, everything we do is in current day and we have this underlying evolutionary reason why we do things but we are human beings living in modern times interacting with the modern world which is why we have a prefrontal cortex our evolutionary ancestors didn't have a prefrontal cortex you know that's why evolution comes first because it's these earlier brain structures and now we have this new brain structure, which is this decision making area. It's that, you know, more logical, rational reasoning that can override these evolutionary responses sometimes. So I, I love evolutionary psychology um, in consideration of modern day environments and modern day contexts. Daniel Kahneman divides it into system one, the fast system yes, and system I, two, right? Amazing book. And it's, it's actually literally true. The book you're referring to is thinking fast and slow, of course. Yes. But what he says, so this, 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 this fast and slow processing is literally true because the neuron path for system one are, are literally shorter. The electrical signals need less yeah. time, you know, so it's physically true than, than the yeah. other system. Yeah. Question to you is, would it be fair to state that, let's say, system one contains, you know, our evolutionary programs, right? And system two, also our neocortex, then tries to control them. And the question then would be, who, which one is stronger? Um, I think it's context dependent again. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, so I can't say in terms of, you know, which one is activated first or which has the strongest activation. 
but I do think there are evolutionary reactions. Um, we know that, you know, our amygdala drives so much of what we do. And I think that does come first. And some people are better at using their prefrontal cortex. Some people are more rational. Some people have learned those behaviors. Whereas a lot of people are very emotional driven. So it depends on the person. It depends on the context. It depends very much on how self-aware we are. Because we have evolved this ability to be self-aware. We've evolved these abilities to reflect, to think about what we're doing, to think, to learn, to be logical. Um, and a lot of people are so much better at this than other people. So again, I think it's very, very person dependent on how strong we are driven by these emotional responses. The question is who actually makes our decisions, right? System one or system two. And we know, yeah. <laughs> we know, we know from empirical uh, science that certain decisions we can predict up to seven seconds in advance before before the, the actual yep. subject. Yep. And we see we see the brain activation before we see the movement. So our brain says, I'm going to do this, and then we do it. And it's that ultimate question, isn't it? You know, are we actually um, in charge of our own behaviors? Or have we evolved to do certain things? Um, I, I am big on the unconscious i think we do so much without realizing why we do things and i think we self-delude and self-deceive all the time and we know that we do because we have so much evidence for it you know the temperature of the room the time of the day our microbiome all of these things affect our decisions and our mood our judgments our interactions our non-verbals and we don't have the ability to control those things actively in that context right now. If I rate someone as very warm because I'm in a warm room or I've just drunk a warm drink, I wouldn't say I, I perceive this interaction as better because I've just had a coffee. I just make those judgments unconsciously. And I am a big believer in most of our judgments are made unconsciously and most of our decisions are unconscious, but we can learn this ability to be reflective. Of we might initially have this judgment, but it doesn't mean we need to run with this judgment because we've evolved to have that ev evolutionary response first. But it doesn't mean we have to just continue with that. We can stop and go, do I really believe this? Let me think about this logically. Let me reevaluate my decision and then let's make a new informed decision. And I think we can do that, but I don't think we can instantly override those evolutionary responses i think that comes first like that and it just depends on our ability to self-reflect following that self-reflection would require mindfulness right which is a totally yes. different topic and without it you cannot yeah. do this do this one step back especially if you're emotionally engaged there's just a refractory period you're aware of it right yeah these are the yep. the moments after uh, after a trigger it's very difficult to jump out Last question for you, yeah. last question for you, Abby. And again, thank you very much for your time. Last question. Knowing all what you do yeah, in regards to human behavior, who little we decide ourselves what we do, yeah, also on a macro level, what's going on right now, because I could imagine yeah. I mean, a little bit of self-reflection would solve all these issues that we are seeing in a, in a heartbeat. Yeah? So knowing all that yeah. you do on a personal level, how do you implement this for yourself? Or better even, how could you advise someone else to implement what you what you know on a personal level in their lives? So I would, I mean, I really think self-reflection is so important. When we make judgments about other people, sit back and think, why did I make that judgment? If you think that person, you know, we can recognize when someone is in distress or showing us cues, but when we are making judgments about someone's personality or about why someone did something, sit back and think, is my mood affecting this? You know, am I just hangry? Do I need a drink? Do I need something to eat? And then will I reevaluate my decision? Just step back away from that subjective view. Go into that system two thinking and think, okay, based on these facts, is this what they were intending? And this is really, really hard to do because we are so cognitively lazy. We have evolved to be fast thinkers, to do the easiest thing. It's it's comfortable and that's what our brains automatically go to. So it's very difficult to step back and be reflective. 
but it's a skill that we learn. You know, the more you do it and the more you think, why have I made this judgment? Why am I doing these things? The more we get better at it. I don't think it will ever be something that's automatic. I think we always have to think about why we're doing things because, you know, we've, like I said, we've evolved to be very cognitively lazy and we have to be aware as much as possible. Last comment on my part. You just said, if you're hungry, right? There is a study <laughs> um, in regards to judges. So if you ever get, if you ever have to go in front of a court, make sure it's after lunch. Because before lunch, yes. <laughs> your chances to get sentenced higher are significantly greater well, than after lunch. And that's a, that's a so scientific study. So if you study. have it in the morning, um, that's the best time. But then before lunch or following 4 p.m., they're the worst times to have an interview to go to court. But just after lunch or just in the morning are the best times. When the blood sugar, le blood sugar level yes. is high, <laughs> best, best time of the day to get sentenced. Exactly. Okay. Abi Marono, um, where can people reach out to you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? For both, for Brink and so, for your personal? Yep, so you can reach me on my personal website, which is just abbymarono.com. You can reach me on LinkedIn, which I think is just Abby Marono, or my Twitter, which is Abby J Marono. And then Brink is just brinkresearch.com. I have your LinkedIn open now. It's Dr. Yes. Abby Marono. Ah, okay. <laughs> Dr. Abby Marono. I changed Good. that as soon as I got my PhD within minutes. <laughs> I can imagine because what you, what you see behind me, I hanged it up there on the first day when I received it, <laughs> my master's. I completely yeah. understand. Okay. Abby, it was my absolute okay. pleasure. It was my absolute pleasure talking to you, especially since we have done this twice and we covered actually different, different things. <laughs> and I will rescue as much as I can from the first interview too. I do my absolute best. Okay. Thank you. It was Many, a pleasure to be here again. Thank you. Many greetings to the UK and I will follow your progress with interest. Thank you. All the best.